Okay, I think we'll get started. Thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, this is a meeting of the Bridge Project, and some of you will be familiar with what the Bridge Project is, some of you less familiar. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes explaining what the Bridge Project is, and then we'll launch into the uh, session itself, which deals with lung cancer from various perspectives. Um, so the uh, this is a collaboration between uh, the Koch Institute here at MIT and the Dana-Farber Harvey Cancer Institute across the river. Uh, the goal of this project is to bring together cancer scientists and cancer-oriented engineers uh, on the MIT campus with cancer scientists and uh, clinicians on the Harvard Dana-Farber campus uh, to join together in team-based research projects that deal with specific cancer types and particularly highly unmet needs involving uh, translational cancer research. Um, three examples are listed here, improvements in detection and monitoring, improvements in drug delivery, uh, and various aspects of dealing with drug resistance. Those are examples of projects that we could envision uh, that could benefit from collaborations between the science and technology orientation here at MIT and the vast um, clinical resources at Harvard. Um, shown below are some of the entities that are involved in this project, the point being that many of the uh, departments and centers here at MIT, which are affiliated with the Koch Institute, and all of the teaching hospitals and uh, many other departments over at the Harvard side are involved in the Bridge Project. This project began in earnest last year. Um, with funding from uh, a small group of individuals, actually, who were motivated to bring together the cancer research uh, talent on both sites together uh, to uh, approach the d disease in a collective fashion. Um, these ind individuals provided us with what you can think of as seed funding to initiate this program. And with that small amount of funding, uh, David Livingston and I decided to focus on two very difficult clinical challenges, notably glioblastoma and pancreas cancer. And as, as some of you will remember last year, we had technical sessions both to describe the clinical unmet needs, um, which took place uh, here, as well as some of the technical opportunities, uh, which took place over at the MGH. These were well-attended meetings. There was a lot of discussion that took place um, related to both sets of topics. And these led, led to subsequent meetings, follow-up discussions, um, that eventually led to proposals. Uh, these proposals were then evaluated by a committee that was composed of both individuals from the MIT side and the Harvard side. Um, the individuals' names are shown here. Bill Kalin, Alice Shaw, Jeff Engelman, and Phil Sharp served on that committee. They received um, 16 grants in response to this RFA. And uh, they ultimately whittled down the number of grants that would be considered in a more formalized fashion uh, by actually an in-person <coughs> interview by the grantees. And amongst the six finalists, four grants were chosen. And those four grants are shown here. Um, and you can see, perhaps, if you can read the description of the work that's being done, that they cover a range of areas. Uh, three of the grants related to pancreas cancer, one glioblastoma, <coughs> using a variety of technical approaches to either understand the disease more fully and or to apply new translational approaches to the treatment of the disease. And I want to emphasize that our goal is to make these projects highly translational, uh, that is, have a clear clinical output, if possible, and if not a direct clinical output, at least a clear vector towards the clinic. Um, obviously, for all of these diseases that we're talking about, there's a lot of important basic science that's needed as well to understand them. But an important goal of the Bridge Project is, is to make the work very relevant to the clinic. So that was the 2011 story. These teams have been funded and they're now at work. Um, I should mention, I don't think it's mentioned here, that these grants were for $750,000 or so uh, over two years. and. Uh, the amount that we're talking about for the future grants is roughly similar. Over the last uh, several months, uh, work of several people, including, importantly, Sharon Stanzak and Susan Korsmeyer and others in the development offices, both at MIT and at um, 
uh, Harvard, uh, Dana Farber Harvard Cancer Center, have been looking for additional funds to support the next round of bridge project grants. And I'm happy to tell you that the Commonwealth Foundation of Virginia, which is the foundation of Bill and Alice Goodwin, that had no connections to MIT or to Harvard for that matter, uh, decided to support this program in a fairly large way. They made a $4.5 million commitment to support additional bridge project grants over the next three years as a sort of trial period. In fact, they gave us clear indications that if this goes well, there's likely to be more money available for future funding uh, down the road. Moreover, um, as we did previously in the case of the uh, lung can I'm sorry, the brain cancer and pancreas cancer, we've uh, worked with other foundations to sort of top up the funding that we got from other donors. And I should have mentioned this previously, the National Brain Tumor Society provided funding in the first round, and the Lust Garden Foundation for Pancreas Cancer Research likewise funded uh, some of the pancreas cancer grants. And so this time as well, we hope to secure additional monies from other disease-specific foundations or from other individuals as we move along, such that we will have uh, enough money to fund several teams uh, in the next round of funding. How many is several? I don't know yet, uh, but I'm hoping it might be as many as five or six, uh, or even possibly more, if it's highly successful. We'll see how that goes. With the money from the uh, uh, from the uh, Commonwealth Foundation, we decided to expand the number of tumor types that we were interested in from the original two to an additional three for a total of five. So I'm listing three here, uh, lung cancers, melanoma, and ovarian cancer, but we're not going to forget about brain and pancreas. They'll be part of the RFA as well, but since we dealt with them last year, we decided we would not deal with them this year as well, but they will be part of the RFA. And to prepare, like we did last year, for um, grants for this round, um, we've decided to organize disease-specific sessions, and we're starting with lung tonight, uh, as well as technology sessions, which will follow in the summer. Uh, we'll let you know when the next disease-specific um, and technology sessions will take place. They're being planned. We may have dates for some of them. I'm looking to see. I don't know if we want to announce those dates. I don't think we do. But uh, we will shortly, so please pay attention to those uh, and come or encourage members of your labs to come uh, to <coughs> learn about, think about, talk about with the goal of putting together applications as we call for them in the fall. And once again, we'll, re we'll review them in the fall with the goal of funding them uh, towards the start of 2013. So that's where the bridge project lies. Uh, we're really excited that we're off the ground and running. Uh, and we have more money to expand the program. Um, there's obviously a great deal of work to be done for all the diseases that we've mentioned. These are all major killers in the context of cancer. And we think that uh, across our two campuses, um, we have a tremendous amount to offer. And uh, if we work together, we can likely uh, hasten the time to uh, find solutions for at least some of these problems. So with that as an introduction, um, tonight we'll feature three presentations um, that cover different aspects of the disease. Um, we'll hear from Yolanda Colson, whom I don't know, but I'm hoping is in the room. Because if she isn't in the room, we're going to have a major hole in the schedule. <laughs> Jeff Engelman will have to talk about surgical <laughs> resection lung cancer. Jacob has said no, but he says he can do it, which is good. He'll have no slides, but that's okay too. Um, we can do a demonstration. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, we should have Alice. Yeah, is Alice ready? Alice is ready. So we'll start with Alice, and then we'll hope that Yolanda shows up. Um, and if she doesn't, then I'll jump in, and then Matt Meyerson will arrive from wherever he is. We know he's coming. He at least emailed us to let us know he would be late. Uh, and then he'll talk about, I'll talk about mouse models, and Alice will talk about therapy, and uh, uh, Matthew will talk about uh, pathology and genomics. And there's time after each presentation for questions and discussion. And again, this is to stimulate ideas, uh, help you make connections, and allow you to think about possible future applications. So I'll stop there for now and turn the podium over to Alice, unless there are any questions of a general nature regarding the bridge project. If 
not. That's all yours, Alice. And uh, <clears throat> today we're going to talk uh, very briefly about kind of an overview of therapies. And you're going to notice that it's going to be certainly biased toward targeted therapies rather than chemotherapy, since as you'll see, that's where we've actually made the most progress. Um, so I'll start with this slide. So this slide, of course, is telling you that I'm biased, because here you are, you can see a small molecule inhibitor that we work with, chrysotinib binding to ALK, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So this is to remind everybody about uh, some basic statistics uh, related to lung cancer. Everyone here probably knows that lung cancer is very common, not just in this country, but in the world. Um, there are about 200,000 new cases of lung cancer every year in this country, and about a little over a million new cases of lung cancer worldwide. Um, it's not the most common cancer. It's probably close to the second most common cancer, but it is the most deadly of all the cancers in both men and women. Shown here is a slide that's summarizes, um, I guess what you could say is the slow pace of progress um, for lung cancer. This summarizes the survival rates for all patients with lung cancer. So this is independent of stage, just taking all patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer and showing you their five-year survival rate as a function of, of uh, time. So back in the 70s, in the 80s, and now more in the 90s. I don't have more recent updated data, but you can see the progress um, in lung cancer has been fairly small um, in terms of overall survival, at least up until 2001. My prediction is that when we have our next bar here showing the next decade, now that we have all these targeted therapies, that we are going to see a, an increase um, in overall survival here, but we don't have that yet. So I'm going to frame all this talk um, today on therapies around one case because uh, I think it's easier for you to kind of get a sense of what we actually see in clinic and then how we approach cases in terms about, of thinking of therapies. And this is actually a patient who I saw with Anna Farrago um, back, I believe, we first met him in February of 2011. Um, and this is a very striking case, and, and I have to say this is not totally atypical. So just to give you a sense, this is not just like some rare zebra that we almost never see. This is a case that unfortunately we see too often now. This is a young patient, 31 years old. He's a never smoker, um, no uh, other known exposures. He is from the Congo, but he was in the U.S. on political asylum, and he was living in, and he is currently living in Georgia. Um, he actually presented to his local doctor in Georgia with several months of shortness of breath and cough, and his doctor appropriately treated him with antibiotics because they assumed he had an infection, but he didn't improve, and eventually he went for a bronchoscopy, so a procedure where they actually looked down his airways, and they identified areas of abnormalities in his lung, biopsied it, and it actually returned as adenocarcinoma, a type of adenocarcinoma that we call bronchoalveolar carcinoma, which is now renamed adenocarcinoma in situ. So here's a picture of his scan, um, actually at diagnosis. So you can see it, this is a CAT scan, it's an axial slice through his chest showing that both his right lung, but particularly his left lung, was really full of cancer, this BAC type of cancer. <clears throat> so normally, what would have happened, say, 10 years ago for that patient? Well, that patient would have been diagnosed with advanced um, non-small cell lung cancer because it's an um, adenocarcinoma type of non-small cell lung cancer. And just 10 years ago, he would have been started on chemotherapy. Um, so we're going to talk just for a couple slides about the role of chemotherapy and man managing patients like this. So back in 1995, this is the first demonstration that chemotherapy does have an important role in treating patients with advanced lung cancer. This was a meta-analysis looking across eight different trials um, that actually started back in the 80s even, and I think it totaled over 800 patients. And you can see that um, patients who actually received chemotherapy, and this is a variety of different chemotherapy regimens, clearly had improved survival compared to those patients who did not receive chemotherapy. Although what you can also tell, which is fairly apparent here, is that the survival benefit from chemotherapy is fairly small. Here the improvement in median overall survival was only on the order of 1.5 months. Since then, there have been many, many studies looking at the different types of chemotherapies, clearly showing that these chemotherapies can improve over progression-free survival as well as overall survival. 
This is a more recent study looking at newer chemotherapy regimens that we use, cisplatin um, pemetrexid versus cisplatin gemcitabine. So these are two different kinds of combinations. And really the point of this slide is to show you that, yes, the chemotherapy does, does improve survival. The type of chemotherapy that we now use depends a bit on the type of non-small cell lung cancer, whether or not it's an adenocarcinoma versus a, a squamous cell carcinoma. So for example, in this particular slide, Patients who have non-squamous, like our patient um, who has adenocarcinoma, seem to do better if they get this particular type of chemotherapy, cisplatin pemetrexid, compared to if they get cisplatin gemcitabine. So there is some dependence on the type of non-small cell lung cancer. But what I also wanted to highlight again is that the benefit for ke from chemotherapy is still rather small. I would say even the newer <coughs> chemotherapy regimens are probably adding on, on the order of three to six months to patients' overall survival. So we're not seeing huge, huge benefits from chemotherapy. This slide is to remind me to tell you that, of course, even though chemotherapy does have some efficacy, as we've seen in, in treat, treatment, there are a lot of toxicities. And this is a, a big problem for our patients, especially patients who are older. And unlike the patient who I just presented to you, many of our patients are in their 60s and 70s and really have a lot of other medical problems that make it difficult to tolerate chemotherapy. So this is a slide summarizing some of the toxicities that we see in these more modern chemotherapy regimens. And you can see we actually see a lot of toxicities, particularly with regards to the bone marrow. <coughs> People have neutropenia and anemia and other non-hematologic side effects as well, fatigue, GI side effects, etc. So these chemotherapies really come at quite a cost for, for our patients. And then that, everything I showed you so far was really the benefit of what we call first-line chemotherapy, which typically are combinations of two drugs, typically a platinum in combination with a second agent. But what happens after first-line chemotherapy? Well, then patients go on to what we call a second-line chemotherapy. That's typically with single drugs or single chemotherapies like pemetrexid or docetaxel. And you can see here that, again, these therapies do have some efficacy in treating our patients with advanced lung cancer, but the benefit is very small. Here it's looking like single agent chemotherapies really are only adding on the order of two to three extra months for our patients. So again, the bottom line from all of this is that first line regimens, second line regimens, modern chemotherapy regimens have some benefit, but it's fairly limited and, it's, and it comes with some side effects. So as I was saying earlier, where we've really made the most progress in lung cancer um, is, is with the identification of specific oncogenic drivers that um, now confer what we call oncogene addiction or dependency on that oncogene to these cancers. And you'll see, what I hope to show you is how um, the discovery and the targeting of these oncogenic drivers have really transformed the way we approach um, patients who have advanced lung cancer and, of course, the way we select therapies now for patients with lung cancer. So as many of you know, um, before 2004, really, we didn't have much of an understanding of the oncogenic drivers in lung cancer. In fact, the one that we mostly focused on was KRAS. Um, so we've known about KRAS as an oncogene for three decades now. And in lung cancer in particular, KRAS mutations are found in almost a quarter of our patients. So it's a very commonly mutated oncogene. However, even today, there really is no good targeted therapy for patients with KRAS. So before 2004, we knew about this, but this really didn't influence the way we treated our patients. All of the patients were pretty much viewed the same and received the standard first-line chemotherapy, followed by second-line, et cetera. But this all changed in 2004, and as all of you know, in 2004, a pivotal discovery was made by several different groups um, at the same time, including groups at Mass General and the Dana-Farber. And this was the discovery of EGFR <laughs> activating mutations in a small subset of patients, about 10 to 15 percent of patients in this country. It's actually much higher in Asian countries. And this mutation was associated with certain clinical features like never smoking status, um, adenocarcinoma histology, also female gender and, and age and ethnicity. Um, but more importantly, um, this, the identification of this particular mutation was incredibly important because this conferred sensitivity to these new targeted therapy pills. At the time, it was gefitinib, or um, what we also call it ERISA, which is a specific EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And so uh, what was reported back in 2004 is that patients who have, oh, sorry, this particular EGFR, these types of activating EGFR mutations really had this remarkable sensitivity to EGFR inhibitors like gefitinib. 
But now, just over the last seven years, you can see the progress that's been made in terms of defining um, more of our population of patients in terms of who has what's underlying oncogenic drivers. So we know not only about KRAS, and EGFR, we now know about other smaller slices of the pie where these patients are defined by oncogenic drivers such as um, ALK rearrangements, we're going to talk about those for two mutations, BRAF mutations, and so forth. And again, the importance of these is that many of these now have targeted therapies that work very well for these specific genetic abnormalities. So this has all led to this idea here. Um, this is a slide I borrowed from Leisha Sequist in my group. And the idea here is very simple, of course, that our patients with non-small cell lung cancer are not all the same. They're actually all quite different. Um, but you can identify subsets of patients um, based on underlying genetic abnormalities. You can group them by their genetic abnormalities. And this then informs what the best treatment will be. And so this, of course, gets to that whole notion of personalizing cancer care. So let's talk a little bit about EGFR inhibitors. And this is what I was mentioning to you earlier, that, that discovery in 2004, and this is one of the papers that came out, was really pivotal because it showed that a patient with an activated EGFR mutation and advanced lung cancer, as shown here, was extremely responsive to gefitinib. You can see this very nice response in their disease. And since then, there have now been many, many studies that have shown um, that EGFR inhibitors like gefitinib and what we use in this country is erlotinib or, or carceva has really now become a standard agent for patients who have EGFR, advanced EGFR mutant lung cancer. So shown here is a slide summarizing five large, maybe more than five, Yep, five large randomized trials now looking at uh, first-line EGFR inhibitors like gefitinib or erlotinib and comparing that to first-line chemotherapy, typically a platinum, a carboplatinum doublet. And in every single trial, there's a clear improvement in response rate as well as progression-free survival when patients with the target, EGFR mutation, are treated with the EGFR inhibitor. And so these findings, actually I'm going to skip over this, but these findings have really led to this idea now um, actually, not an idea, but what we do now, which is to actually genotype all of our patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer for the presence of EGFR mutations. And for those patients who have EGFR <coughs> mutations, they actually receive first-line EGFR inhibitors. They do not even receive first-line chemotherapy. They all start with targeted therapies based on those randomized trials. So that just shows you how important it is now. We incorporate genotyping into the diagnosis of our patients, and then we use that information to determine the first choice, uh, the first uh, therapy for them. So what about our patients? Well, this patient did undergo EGFR testing, um, which is standard now. And because he was quite sick at the time, um, and he was a never smoker, he was started empirically by his local oncologist on first-line erlotinib, um, which, as I mentioned, is like gefitinib. Um, and actually, he didn't improve at all. Um, he actually, if anything, got worse. And I believe this is when Anna and I met him, um, when he had basically had further disease progression despite being on erlotinib. And in fact, consistent with that, when his genetic testing returned, he really was EGFR wild type. And in fact, these days, in our center, certainly, we wouldn't even have started this patient on first line um, erlotinib without knowing his mutation status. We would always do that mutation testing first, and then based on that, decide whether or not he's a candidate for a targeted therapy. So here he is. This is actually when Anna and I met him. So this is his scan I showed you already. And after several months of erlotinib, you can see that he had this clear progression of disease, and he was actually quite sick at the time. So what happened next? Well, he was referred to us actually for ALK testing. So what's ALK? Well, ALK is anaplastic lymphoma kinase, and many of you know this, so I'll just quickly summarize. But back in 2007, ALK rearrangements, chromosomal rearrangements of the ALK gene were first identified in a small subset of non-small cell lung cancer patients. There are a number of different types of rearrangements that can occur, and all of these rearrangements lead to fusion of the entire intracellular tyrosine kinase domain of ALK to a 5' end partner like EML4, KIF5B, or TFG. And this then leads to constitutive activation of the tyrosine kinase, and this of course drives downstream signaling and actually drives um, the growth and actually dependency on continued ALK signaling. ALK is not a new oncogene, actually. Many of you know that it was first identified in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and 
other arrangements as well as alk activating mutations are found in a handful of other cancers, including a rare type of soft tissue sarcoma, as well as pediatric neuroblastoma. So alk is an important oncogene um, in, in across a number of different disease uh, types. This was from that original paper in 2007, which made sort of that critical discovery that ALK uh, fusion proteins are oncogenic, and here are the T3 assays and in nude mice, and they also did experiments in this paper showing that you could inhibit ALK uh, by treating with a small molecule and actually have regression of these tumors, um, confirming that this really was an oncogenic driver that could be targeted. So, at that time, when ALK was first discovered, this drug, Prozotinib, was already in clinical trials. It was known to inhibit ALK, although it was first developed as a C-MET inhibitor, but it also <coughs> happens to be an extremely potent tyrosine kinase inhibitor of ALK as well, as well as a few other uh, kinase targets. And so patients started enrolling on, uh, patients were identified with ALK-positive lung cancer, started enrolling on a phase one trial of Prozotinib. And this is uh, some data from the phase one trials, which is pretty remarkable. This is the first or sort of first study of Prozotinib and already, because we were able to identify patients with the right target and treat them with the targeted therapy, we were able to see these pretty incredible responses. So this is now 106 patients that are shown here, a waterfall plot where each bar represents an individual patient's tumor's response, and you can see all the downward bars indicate that pretty much almost all patients will respond to Prozotinib if they're ALK positive, meaning they have the ALK rearrangement. Um, the response rate turned out to be about 60%. Those are the green bars. Patients with sort of a less, slightly less response are called stable disease, shown in red. And really, there's just a small minority of patients, really less than 10% of patients, that have what we believe is probably intrinsic resistance to uh, the targeted therapy. And we don't actually know the mechanisms for that at all. We did follow-up studies, um, now looking at crizotinib in a large global phase two trial, and this is just some of the data. We now have over 900 patients that have gone on this trial, but again, you can see the exact same, very impressive response of ALK-positive patients to uh, crizotinib. And just because you guys may not be looking at those waterfall plots all the time, I wanted to show you kind of a, a representative example of what waterfall plots typically look like in the oncology world. So this is a phase two trial of serafinib, which is really a multi um, targeted um, kinase inhibitor. And uh, you can see that in a population of non small cell lung cancer patients, these are not genotyped or anything, these are just all comers. This is what our typical response um, responses look like. You on occasion have some responses shown over here, but by and large, you really don't see many responses. All of these patients on this side have had tumor growth, and so they're not responding. So those two waterfall plots I showed you with Krizatina really are quite remarkable. And this is an example of a patient um, of mine who had ALK positive lung cancer, very extensive disease in his lungs, as you can see by all these white patches throughout both lungs. He was found to be ALK positive, was treated with crizotinib, and actually just after 12 weeks had a very dramatic response and did very well for about 18 months. <laughs> This is uh, uh, what we call progression-free survival, looking at how long does the response to crizotinib last in ALK-positive patients. And on average, it lasts about 10 months or so. And this is actually pretty typical for what we see for targeted therapies, that unfortunately, even though the responses are very marked at times, um, that patients inevitably will relapse. And most patients will relapse around 9 to 12 months. And we'll obviously come back to this, because this is one of the uh, biggest unmet needs um, in the targeted therapy world. So all that data I showed you led to approval of crizotinib. It's now an approved drug in the U.S. And in fact, just like for EGFR mutant lung cancer, where we use erlotinib first line, now in our country, um, we actually diagnose patients. I think I have a next slide on this. Diagnose patients, and we look for both EGFR mutation as well as evidence of ALK rearrangement, and that determines the patient's first-line therapy. If they're found to be ALK positive at diagnosis, we now treat all of our patients first-line with the targeted agent and not with chemotherapy. So how about our patient? So Anna and I saw him. We ordered ALK testing. And unfortunately, he became back ALK negative. Um, and we then set out to do more genetic testing for this patient. Um, including what we call at our institute Snapshot, which is a multiplex um, panel of genetic tests that look for specific oncogenic mutations as well as specific mutations in tumor suppressor genes. We also looked for abnormalities in this gene called ROS, which can be rearranged in lung cancer. 
took us about two months to do all of this extra testing. And during this time, this poor patient was doing quite a bit worse, declining. Um, and fortunately, he came back as positive for Ross rearrangement. So what is Ross? Actually, Ross has a long history here at MIT, thanks to Al Perez in the Hausman lab. Um, Al actually had worked on um, Ross, I believe, in the, uh, must have been started in the late 90s, I believe. Um, in any case, Al had actually found that this gene, Ross, which encodes a receptor tyrosine kinase, could be rearranged in glioblastoma. It was found as a fig Ross fusion. Um, which is very interesting, um, but not much work happened after that until this paper came out, and this was published by the Cell Signaling Group in Beverly, where they now identified rearrangement, chromosomal rearrangement of this Ross genes, very analogous to the ALK rearrangements that I mentioned to you, in one lung cancer patient and in one lung cancer cell line, and it showed some preliminary data that this was an oncogenic driver as well. And actually, since then, quite a lot of work has been done to, to show that there are, definitely are a number of different types of oncogenic Ross fusions that can occur in non-small cell lung cancer. This is a very similar demographic of patients as what we see for ALK. So Ross fusions tend to occur in younger patients, never smokers, adenocarcinoma patients. Um, and, but unlike ALK, which is found in about 4 or 5% of our patients, Ross is quite rare. It's really only in about 1 at most 2% of our patients. The other important thing I wanted to point out here is that these oncogenic drivers that I've been talking about really are all mutually exclusive. They really don't overlap. So patients have one or the other, and they tend to not have both. Now, how, did Ross, how does Ross tie in with ALK? Well, it turns out that Ross and ALK are actually very related. Um, they're all actually members of the insulin receptor superfamily. And uh, there was some data from, generated from MGH showing that uh, the Ross positive cell line was actually sensitive to ALK inhibitors like TAE6A4. And so there was, has always been a question, well, why is this? Well, if you look at the tyrosine kinase domains of Ross and ALK, they're actually very, very similar. There's 77% identity in the ATP binding site. And this is data that was generated by Pfizer looking at the overlay of the um, Ross and the ALK tyrosine kinase binding domains. And you can see that chrysotinib binds almost identically within both of these binding domains. And there are only a few amino acid differences and really only one that may make contact with chrysotinib. And so really, chrysotinib, remarkably, inhibits not only ALK really well, which I mentioned before, but actually inhibits this Ross tyrosine kinase almost equally as well. So back to our case, because we knew that, and we had some data from the lab suggesting that Ross would confer sensitivity to chrysotinib, Anna and I enrolled this patient on the phase one trial of chrysotinib. There's a Ross expansion cohort. As I mentioned, the patient was quite sick by the time we did all his genetic testing very hypoxic, um, uh, systemically very ill. And here he is um, in April when we finally got him genotyped and started on the trial. Again, that really significant tumor burden in the left lung, also spreading throughout his right lung. And then, of course, here is his response after just eight weeks of treatment with chrysotinib, showing complete resolution of disease. And this patient was very typical of all of our patients who have these kinds of oncogene-addicted cancers, where they're exquisitely sensitive to the targeted therapy. And their symptoms, especially when they're this sick, will improve even within a couple doses of the targeted therapy. And this patient actually is still doing well now at about 14 months later. This is data that I'm going to show actually next week at ASCO, showing that that wasn't, again, not just an exceptional case, but this is something that's true for Ross in general, that Ross, just like ALK, really does confer sensitivity to chrysotinib. This is now 14 patients with Ross rearrangements that have gone on to chrysotinib, and again, a waterfall plot showing you that basically every Ross patient does respond to chrysotinib. This case out here of a progression actually turned out to be Ross negative. So Ross, again, defines yet this new subset of lung cancers that we know about for which we have a very good targeted therapy. So now, again, at MGH and a number of centers, we do upfront testing for all of these different mutations. And these, in particular, have clear therapeutic implications um, in terms of what the therapy will be. So what's ahead? Well, certainly that's all great, but there's many, there are many, many other questions, and as we're trying to address tonight, unmet needs in the lung cancer world, and I would say this is one of the major ones. Um, so these therapies work well, as I mentioned, for about 9 to 12 months, um, and after that time, the disease starts to grow back. Um, and I should say that's a rough average. We have some patients where the disease comes back earlier after just a couple months, and actually we have patients who have been going on close to 10 years on targeted therapy, so there's a huge range. But by and large, most patients will have disease relapse by about a year or two. 
This is a patient of mine who was ALK positive. She had a lot of disease at baseline, got treated with crizotinib on the phase one trial and had this beautiful near complete response after just eight weeks. And she did really well for almost three years on crizotinib. But you can see by about three years, her disease had basically all grown back. And this is just very, this is very common um, for us to see for all of our patients who go on to targeted therapies. I'm not gonna show you, because we don't have time to show you, but all the data that's been done at not only our institution and the Engelman lab, but at many institutions looking at this question of targeted therapy resistance. This is a summary of what we found for crizotinib resistance, just to illustrate to you how complicated this area is. So what we know about crizotinib resistance based on about close to 30 patients now is that in about a quarter of cases, you can have changes in the target itself so that ALK no longer can bind crizotinib, and this can be because of a resistance mutation or because of amplification of the ALK gene itself. In close to one half of cases, though, there isn't uh, any evidence of target gene alteration, but instead there's activation of other growth pathways, and there are many of these. But we found, for example, that EGFR can be abnormally activated as well as CKIT, and that this can serve as a means of bypassing inhibition by crizotinib. And of course, over here in this gray, we really don't have any idea why some patients develop <coughs> resistance at all. And so these, this is really informing what we do next for our patients once they relapse on targeted therapies. As an example, for patients who have a known resistance mutation in ALK or amplification of ALK, there's a lot of interest in developing what we're calling second generation ALK inhibitors. And as you can see here, there's a long list of them coming along. And these really are being designed to overcome resistance when it's mediated by some type of alter alteration in ALK itself. But remember, I showed you that pie chart where it's only one quarter of patients that have target gene alteration and the remaining patients don't. So we really don't have great solutions for the remaining three quarters of patients who are developing resistance. But just to show you that these more potent um, ALK inhibitors may potentially have a role, this is that same patient I showed you who developed resistance. We know her resistance is actually mediated by a secondary mutation within ALK that uh, limits binding of crizotinib. And after just a few months of treatment with a new second generation ALK inhibitor, she's actually had this beautiful response again. So these ALK, second generation ALK inhibitors can be very effective. So I just wanted to end on two, two slides, this one, um, which again summarizes all the oncogenic drivers that we know about so far in non-small cell lung cancer. As I mentioned, we do have these great targeted therapies for some of these subsets, but all of these patients at some point will relapse. And so we need to understand the mechanisms of resistance and to develop second line options for these patients. And what I wanted to highlight over here is that all of these patients here in the gray are the patients for which we actually haven't identified any oncogenic drivers. And so these patients really have no targeted therapy options. And so certainly one of our main priorities is to discover more of these oncogenic drivers. Um, and it's not certainly going to be as simple probably as what we've seen so far is going to be more complicated. But I think a lot of um, uh, our, our priority should be focused on here because this is the bulk of our patients who are not able to benefit from targeted therapies. So I'll end there. Thanks, Thank Alice. You. Uh, so we have time for questions for Alice. Um, maybe I'll start. As you showed the pie chart at the end. You made three points. One, resistance is likely. We know it's true. We need to understand it the unknowns, and then there's the RAS sector. So if you could summarize your thoughts about RAS, thought a lot about it, uh, sort of where we are, where we're headed in that respect. So, and actually, sorry to interrupt, Yolanda is here. I was hoping to use your laptop, if that's sure. possible. Uh, and I'll also introduce David Livingston, Deputy Director of the Harvard Dana-Farber Cancer Center, my uh, partner in crime with respect to the Bridge Project. Welcome, David. Thank you. So RAS. Oh, so RAS has proven very difficult to challenge. We've known about RAS forever, and I spent many years in Tyler's lab trying to understand how to target oncogenic KRAS. Um, I would say some one of the most promising approaches to oncogenic KRAS right now is looking at uh, downstream signaling pathways. Of course, Jeff Engelman's lab has done a lot of work looking at com combinations of targeted agents, PI3 uh, PI kinase inhibitors combined with MEK inhibitors, and has seen very nice results actually in, in the JAPS mouse model. And that combination actually is going through clinical testing, and I think it is a very promising combination. There also is um, some promise to combining chemotherapy specifically with MEK inhibitors. 
years. Um, there does seem to be uh, some, for some subset of KRAS mutant lines, more dependency on um, the RAS, uh, RAS mech ERK pathway. Um, and for that subset, uh, they can be very sensitive to mech inhibition and potentially combined with chemotherapy. In fact, there's going to be a presentation at ASCO by Dr. Yanni um, showing for the first time a real uh, benefit to uh, combining chemotherapy with mech inhibitor. So I think we should focus on in that area and, again, look for novel ways as well to target KRAS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this, <clears throat> yeah. uh, so I have a question about metastasis. So we spoke a lot about terminal treatments here. Uh, so when we think about treatments, should we also uh, consider or have metastasis in mind here? Or would you have you know, your comments or thoughts about this? So yeah, so pretty much my whole talk, and I should have emphasized, it really was on advanced or metastatic lung cancer. Um, we can talk for another hour about the earlier stage lung cancer and detection of lung cancer, but everything I talked about was advanced. So all the patients that we've been treating with chemotherapy and with targeted therapy, they already have metastatic disease. And in general, but not always, all the disease responds the same way, for example, to a targeted therapy. So some of those responses I showed you, you know, you could see that all the spots of the cancer were responding. And in general, in general, the metastatic sites behave like the primary sites. However, it's a good point because there certainly are examples of mixed responses, both to chemotherapy as well as to targeted agents. Um, so there clearly can be differences in biology in the metastatic sites, and we don't really understand that. Part of the difficulty, as you can imagine, is we don't biopsy every site. We typically will biopsy one site, often a metastatic site, or if it's clearly metastatic, we'll just biopsy the primary site. And so we don't really do comparisons at any level, histology or genetics, usually between primary the primaries and the metastatic lesions. Alan? Yeah, thanks for that really clear presentation. I appreciate that very much. So is there any hint that the, a mechanism of resistance is that the drug is being broken down or pushed out by the cells? And, yeah, you know? well, um, is there any evidence for that? Well, we certainly think that could be another mechanism. So what I showed you was really just um, sort of genetic approaches to looking at different mechanisms of resistance, but I absolutely agree with you that there are certainly other mechanisms, and one has to wonder the, if there's a role for these such as upregulation of drug efflux pumps, um, potentially lowering the levels, uh, the effective levels in, in tumor cells. We don't know. We don't have a good way of looking at that, and that is one potential thing that could work out well in terms of collaboration between MIT and the hospitals. Tom? Oh, that was a very nice talk. Uh, is there any, uh, any data on adjuvant therapy? You showed a lot of advanced cancer. Yes. Uh, so yes, there is data, and um, again, that would be a whole other talk, which sorry I didn't do, but um, there's certainly been a proven survival benefit to using adjuvant chemotherapy in patients who have stage two or stage three resected lung cancer. And uh, I, I would say a big question is, how about the role of targeted therapies as adjuvant agents? And we don't actually know that the jury is still out. So right now, all the targeted therapies that I mentioned for you really are used only in the advanced setting. We don't yet know how to incorporate them into treatment of either resected patients or patients with locally advanced disease. But there are, are ongoing trials looking at those questions. Maybe I'll ask the last question, Alice. <clears throat> you didn't talk about small cell lung cancer. So if you could say in one sentence the state of the art <coughs> for the treatment of small cell lung cancer, what would you say? There is nothing for small cell lung cancer. Thank you, Alice. Next witness. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Alice. Okay, so our next presentation will come from Yolanda Colson, who's uh, a yeah. uh, thoracic surgeon from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, who's on call today, which explains why she was late, but uh, we very much appreciate her being here. And she's going to talk about uh, uh, aspects of uh, surgical control for lung cancer. Thanks very much. I'm very sorry I didn't get here on time and I didn't catch the memo that it was moving faster, so this will be fine. I'll do the PC to Mac conversion, so we'll see how this works. Um, you already know the lung cancer is bad. I do think it's important if you don't realize that more women are dying from breast cancer, uh, from lung cancer than breast ovarian and uterine, and more men are dying from, than from prostate and colon, so it's a really important thing, and I think it gets missed on how important this problem really is. 
Um, what I do think is interesting here is the observation that I'm sure we've already talked about. Yeah, maybe. Okay, is that here, that, that obviously it's dismal in terms of our survival, but it's also the percent that we diagnose as early is really low. And I think those are really two important things that, that really matter in this disease. Most patients are diagnosed with distant disease, and that's how we look at the disease, and that's how it's talked about. And our colleagues will all say that hope does not, is not warranted here. We disagree with them. We think there's a lot of stuff that we can do. And we've talked about a little bit of the surgical options, radiation, chemotherapy, and these combined therapies. And so I'm going to talk a little bit from the surgeon's perspective because we see a very different disease and have very different problems. And I think that gets lost a lot of times when we talk about this. What we choose and how we treat depends on where the lung cancer is located, how extensive it is, and the size of it actually determines our approach. And those are really important things. I used to be an engineer, and so you'll see how that comes through in this talk. The issues, the outcomes, and your perception of lung cancer is very dependent on who you see and who you treat. And I think that's really important. There's the four stages of one through four. Um, and the reality is surgeons tend to live in these boxes at the top, these three, which are not the most patients, but certainly are the ones that have the better survival. This is localized disease or fairly localized disease whereas the majority of patients are in these boxes here in the lower three, and the reality is they don't have as good survival, and that accounts for our five-year survival being so low. To me, these are very distinct problems. Yes, they're related, they're the same disease, but how we treat them is very different, and therefore our problems are very different. This is a classic time paper from the actual previous chief at, at Brigham, which if they can operate, you're lucky, is what it says in the, in the lesion. And the point is that complete surgical resection still offers the best survival, and we still strive for that, all of us, to see if there's a way to make that happen. So what do we do in surgery? Because most people actually don't know this. In general, our operations break down into three types. A segmentectomy, or a wedge, which is where we just take where the tumor is and cut around it. A lobectomy is we take a true defined segment of the lung here. Okay, so it's about 25% of your lung function goes away, even if it's a small nodule. And we do that to try to get all the lymphatics that drain as well. And a pneumonectomy is if you have to take the whole lung because of where the tumor sits, it's involving both of them. That's a huge difference between here to here. So we talked about segmentectomy, works great for a small peripheral lesion. Maybe somebody who has emphysema, they can't tolerate a big reception. We will try to do that. There's a cost to that, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Lobectomies are the standard of care if you have an isolated lung lesion to take that lobe, meaning taking the whole kind of section that's together there because it takes all the lymphatics, we get our lowest recurrence rate. The problem with a wedge or a segment is that your recurrence rate can be almost two to three times higher locally if you do a wedge than if you do a lobectomy. Okay? A pneumonectomy is usually for central lesions and you lose half to 60% of your lung function by taking that. So it's not, it's not thought of lightly. If they have one lung cancer, the chances of getting another lung cancer is one to 2% per year. So if you've got a young person that does that and you take out a pneumonectomy, your chances are not low that you're gonna end up with lung cancer on the other side. So we really do think about how much lung do we have. And that's a very important concept. Some special things for surgery for, uh, for lung cancer. Yes, most patients present with advanced disease, but that still leaves us 25 to 50,000 people a year who will probably have some surgical role to play if you look at the total overall numbers of 200,000 who get diagnosed. That's not an inconsequential number of people. Yes, it's only 25% of the numbers, but that's still more than gets certain cancers completely. So it's an important group to think about and how to optimize. What we'd like to do is at least cure all those 25 to 50,000 people, and we're not doing that yet. Even though it's the best chance for survival, those that we think are cured at five years, um, if you talk, look at stage by stage, when you saw that other diagram, it's about 50%, maybe 80% that have a five year survival with the very earliest. If it's a very small lesion, you can get to 80%. Most stage ones are somewhere around 50. If you have stage two, which is where the local lymph nodes are involved, you're talking about in the 40s. So we still don't cure them. And if they get local recurrence, your survival drops from 60% to about 18 to 24%. So local recurrence is a real problem. 
This is kind of, you can tell the engineers drew this for me. I used to be an engineer too. There's only four fingers. That's why I can tell. Um, so you take the tumor out. It's all out, but then it recurs locally or it recurs usually in the lymph nodes or elsewhere. Here's the numbers that talk about that. Stage one, two, and three, what's our recurrence rate? Local regional is fairly stable across the stages because you just haven't gotten far enough past the tumor. So I've got 14% here. If it's a large tumor and you're wedging out really close and it's and you're not very far from it, you'll end up with a 30% recurrence rate. The distal is, <coughs> you can see, increases with the increasing advancement of that stage. There's two points. Surgeons take local recurrence very personally. It's a failure on your part if you haven't accomplished that. Even though it may be micrometastatic disease, we still take it very personally. And the second question in these early stage lung cancer patients, if they're getting distant disease, were they undertreated or understaged? And so that's something that surgeons really think about. The local recurrence rate impacts survival. I'm trying to give you some numbers so you can kind of work with these. If you look at stage one lung cancer, 16% recurrence rate following a wedge resection compared to 7 to 9% following a lobectomy. So you almost double your recurrence rate by that decision to go small. If you don't have lung function and you're not going to be able to get off the breathing machine, the ventilator, that doesn't matter. But it does matter if you're just doing it for other reasons. If your margin is less than a centimeter, your risk of recurrence doubles. So trying to get close is it has its costs. Not all patients can tolerate a lobectomy, as we talked about. And if they recur, less than about a third are candidates for surgical resection, either because they couldn't tolerate a big resection in the first place, or because not only do they have local recurrence, they have distant recurrence. Um, mistakes, we all make it. This is what we're talking about. If you cut too close, you make the decision to do a small resection. You, 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 it, it, it's a problem. So one of the challenges that we're talking about challenges is, can we do surgery better? And we'll talk more about that, of what are those advances at the end. We need some innovative therapies to prevent these recurrences, be it regional, local, or distal. And so some of the attempts that have been done to do that, people are now looking at wedge resections and then doing post-op radiation to those areas where they've ended up with a local recurrence rate. We talked about historically, it's been probably 14% to 20% and down to 6.25. The drawbacks are we're now radiating lung that probably wasn't in a patient who didn't have good lung. And you have bystander lung irradiation, so you may actually, would it be a, been better just to take that lung out? Probably one of the more popular things right now are all these different types of brachytherapy. There's I-125, there's also different types of isotopes that are being used. And they're actually sewing them into the suture line. And they've been down to about 6% with a three-month follow-up, which is much better. Um, and they have now done studies to show that they actually can increase survival by several months and decreasing the rate of recurrence in these patients. So that's becoming very popular, and there is now a clinical trial and a natural clinical trial on that. Drawbacks is now everyone's trying to sow in radiation seeds in the OR, which is cumbersome, it's very hard to get them where you want them, and it's difficulty to sow all those seeds. Um, this is something we've been working on, which I won't go into detail and I can talk about later, is actually looking at chemotherapy eluding films, which get placed in at the area of the wedge so that drug releases outward, and we've got penetration of a centimeter or more in order to try to prevent that recurrence. So that's kind of an engineering perspective of how to look at this problem. Perseverance, we keep persevering even though we don't always work. This is the idea of not turning back when it's obvious you should. And to us, it's looking, okay, let's try to figure out how we can do local regional recurrence now. We talked a little bit about the survivals. If you look at survival of localized, where we think the nodes have no disease in them, if it gets to the first node, it significantly drops the survival. If it gets to the next group of nodes, it even further does. So once it's out in the lymph nodes, the game changes, and it's a very hard thing for us. We will do a lobectomy because we will take all these nodes with it in an attempt to try to prevent it going further, and it also tells us to sample, so we already know that the patient's not at stage one, they're stage two. The other part that's coming out, surgeons are very interested in those lymph nodes and what does it tell us, and that has to do with missing nodal disease. We can take the nodes out, we look at them by pathology, we cut them in half, we look at them and say there's no tumor. What we're finding is if we actually go back and do multiple sections or PCR or looking at them, we're finding that anywhere between 16% of those nodes we said were negative arms, they really are positive, 
Almost 30% of patients with a one centimeter or less adenocarcinoma actually have disease, and that was a big, big CALGB trial, or yeah, CALGB trial. And when they looked at those patients, not knowing that they had lung cancer, metastatic disease, because they were told they were negative, and retrospectively found out they were positive, they actually get decreased survival and had an increased risk of recurrence. So we know it does matter if we only knew that they were positive. And so the problem is the lung is very unique in that it is very hard to find those nodes. They don't necessarily drain as we would predict. And there's currently no mechanism of reliably finding a sentinel node in lung cancer, which is a surgical trial now going on in Brigham to try to figure this out because that is a, a staging issue for us. So that's another challenge for us. Chemotherapy doesn't get to the lymph nodes very effectively. If you give it IV, this is a study done in patients that happen to have breast cancer, but they give IV chemotherapy, and then at all these different time points, took that patient to the OR and took out the, breast, the axillary nodes of their breast cancer and found they never got chemotherapy detected in there. If they gave it around the tumor and got lymphatic drainage and looked at what the drug was, if they gave the drug around the tumor, they actually did get chemotherapy, suggesting that one of the real challenges that I think are going to come up in the next several years is how can we deliver drug best? We have kind of conventional ways we do it, but I think we need to start thinking about different ways of delivering it. And one of those ways is there's been lots of people looking at nanoparticles. This happens to be one of our pictures where we're looking at drug with nanoparticles. And you can actually see this is in a large animal that it migrates over 40 centimeters over we inject it at night and the next day come back. And this is with near infrared tags so we can follow them and it goes to the lymph nodes that would be draining this area and then we can start to follow them and can see the drug gets there. And so there's gonna be a lot of things on the horizon about how better to drain, uh, deliver drug, how can we target it? And I think surgeons are very interested in looking at local deliveries and ways of targeting areas that we see come back as disease. So here's my list of challenges for you. One, can we do surgery better? I love this, more minimally invasive, but more minimally. So if we can do even more minimally invasive surgery, right now we went from the big incisions to the small um, instruments that we can actually manipulate. There are people that are very interested in collaborating on robotics. They came and talked to me about that today, saying, can you, can you get us somebody? So trying to figure out how can we design it better? How can we do that better? How can we visualize? How can we make this not such a big recovery? It takes patients, even with the minimally invasive stuff, they can't get chemotherapy for several weeks. It takes a while to do that. Stereotactic body radiotherapy, I didn't talk about, but I kind of think of it in the surgery group. You're doing local treatment. You're trying to control that. It's, uh, I think it's going to be very involved in replacing or doing parts of surgery, and I think that's going to do it. And I don't know what else is in this audience people have thought of the next new invention. It will change. We haven't even talked about can we save or grow lung tissue. These people who don't have good lung tissue, can we grow them a new lobe if we take their lobe out? I mean, if you really start to think out of the box, those are the types of things that we need to think about. Can we prevent local regional recurrence, either by identifying these tumors? Can we microscopically, with something, see where there's a little bit of tumor cell behind, at the margin, at the node, somewhere else? Can we sterilize these margins or nearby nodes? And can we treat early lung cancer better by either detecting it earlier, staging it better, or giving more targeted therapy, which was going to lead into Alice's <laughs> Um That's all I have, but I think we're on time, so that's good. Perfect. Thank you. That was terrific. Um, we do have time for questions. Please. Can you say a little bit more about uh, the seeds <coughs> that you sow in during, at the end of the surgery? You said there is, there's a process where they'll try to sow in the seeds that is difficult. So there's a couple ways to do it. So radiation seeds, I should actually have, you can describe it, they look better than anybody, but they're essentially little areas of um, radioactive Dot, and not die, radioactive seeds, they are, that are usually strung along on a, on a string. Okay. And you can calculate out the dose, and they have set rates that they want to do, and they cut off this string, and, you can, and, and it comes with a needle on it, and so they sew it through. Usually it comes on a mesh, and so most people are putting it on a mesh and then sewing in at so much spacing, and then it gets put on, and then the mesh is getting sewn onto the lung tissue directly. You can imagine that it's probably pretty hard to keep it so each seed is equidistant from your suture line and is equivalent. The thing that I didn't emphasize here 
was there's been a lot of concern with, with healing. And so if we're putting radiation seeds on our suture line, does that mean it's not going to heal well? Does that mean they're going to get an air leak? Does that mean, so there's certain places we don't put those. We don't put them on <coughs> a big airway that we've divided. Because if you get a hole in an airway that now opens up, they'll end up with an infection that's life-threatening and we end up with a big infection in the chest. So you have to choose wisely where you can put it or show that it isn't hurting the healing. So it's, right now it's very rudimentary and it's just taking this mesh with a grid of radiation that will elute over usually about half a centimeter, a couple, centimeters, a couple of millimeters, and it'll elute into the tissue, that x-ray, or that radiation, so that it'll sterilize that suture line, is what they're trying to do, without making it so it can't heal. Okay. Along the lines of trying to find out whether there are any residual tumors anywhere else, are there, are there, is there any progress on imaging these things before surgery, putting in some trace of it? So there is the surfaces a, we, of tumor cells, for example? We, we don't have a way that we don't have lung cancer specific markers to do that. We do have the PET scan, which a PET scan is, is basically radio labeled glucose that gets injected and those use it. And so all these patients, for the most part, get a PET scan. That probably requires a reasonable size. It requires a reasonable size. You've you got to have at least a centimeter. So if you got a big lymph node and it's really bright, yes, you can see that. But you're not going to see microscopic, and we don't have a great way to do that yet. So one thing I worry about a lot when I give a lot of radiation therapy as local therapy is that a patient would in fact have that micrometastatic disease that you're missing. So one thing I was thinking about is that one might be able to identify genetic features of a tumor that might double or triple the probability that a patient would have that, and that you could work that in together with PET scans and the like, decide whether it would be worth proceeding with surgery or radiation. I mean, right now, I think we haven't really looked. Lung cancer has been so understudied for so long. We are 20 years behind breast cancer. We don't have the markers. We don't have the genes. We don't know who's the people who are at real high risk and aren't. We're, we're just starting that now, which is which is great that we're starting it. So I think we'll learn who are the people to look for, and we'll learn the markers, and hopefully we'll be able to find where they're hiding. So can I ask you, you mentioned in your own work that you're using implants of uh, drug-delivering materials in the context of the surgical wound. Right. Um, is that being done at all in collaboration with people here at MIT? And regardless of the answer to that question, where do you see the limitations in what you're able to do now? What do you, what do you think you need to go in that direction? So I think that there are, I think that field's just opening up. I happen to serendipitously found engineers that we started working on this type four or five years ago with some collaboration with BU. Doesn't mean that we aren't open to any of this at all, because we absolutely are. I think what it what it is is looking at what are the characteristics of designing that polymer. And as an engineer, I really enjoyed working with the engineers because what we sit down is and we do, you want to call it that intelligent design. I don't just want it to dump it. I need it to make it so it won't bother me when I'm healing. What are the characteristics? How do we make it flexible for the lung? How do we make it conformable? How do we make the right drug deliver over time when I want it, not when I don't want it? And those are really important decisions when I've got to work around healing, I've got to work around location, I've got to make it applicable, but I don't have to make a big incision to put it in. And I think those technical limitations of how to do that are important. What are the different kinds of drugs? We really need to work on where we can start to deliver any drug. Right now, we're very limited by the polymer chemistry that we know. And so I think looking at how um, to do those things, it doesn't have to be chemotherapy. How can we do a variety of things? But thinking about it from a surgical perspective is different. Yes. You know, um, are there currently any data that correlate um, perception of how much tumor was removed all the way up to Looks like it was a pretty clean operation with the kinds of DNA mutation analysis that one can achieve in blood by the so-called beaming method or others. You actually try to correlate the effect of removing a certain amount of tissue all the way up to the point at which there's no apparent or residual disease. Right. Suspected maybe just given the demographics. Right. 
But and no, and those kinds of studies are for that. I, I don't think we're. I think we're just starting to learn how to do that. Yeah. Because these methods are pretty simple. Just look for mass mutations or alpha mutations or whatever. Right. Right. And I think it's been very rudimentary where we started. It was tumor take out. And that's kind of where we've been. And I think we're really starting to think about it as a true molecular systemic yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. Terrific, Yolanda. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, it was terrific. So we're going to move on to Matthew, who's going to initially go first, but he had some students graduating today. so he. Couldn't be here at the beginning. Alice has already covered some of the genetics of lung cancer, you should know. Uh, and we're trying to condense, so I'm going to ask Matt and the other speakers to finish in 15 minutes if possible. Okay. So I will uh, uh, cut further, or Alice, can, Alice will point at me if I'm going to say something that she's already said before. Um, thank you very much, Tyler, for uh, the opportunity to speak here. And I'm going to talk about uh, uh, genome alterations in lung cancers. Uh, first, uh, to briefly talk about uh, ongoing genomic analyses of lung adenocarcinoma, uh, and then uh, genomic analyses of uh, squamous cell lung carcinomas uh, as part of the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. Okay, I'm going to skip these because you know these, uh, and I'm going to go directly to our new data. Okay, um, just to say what's already, I'll just briefly say what do we already know about alterations in. Um, uh, lung adenocarcinoma, um, frequent uh, EGFR mutations, or V2 mutations, ALK fusions, ROS1 fusions, and RET fusions, uh, which were probably described to some degree by Alice in her, her presentation, as well as tumor suppressor gene mutations, um, in particular in the STK11, uh, serine dreaming kinase that's in the PI3 kinase pathway, uh, in the TP53 uh, tumor suppressor gene, which uh, Tyler may discuss a little bit the role of in, in, in mouse models as well. Uh, and in KEEP1, which is a, uh, it goes a ubiquitin ligase for uh, NFE2L2. Okay, our uh, project involves some um, uh, whole exome sequencing of 205 uh, tumor normal pairs from 205 individuals. Uh, we're covering about 18, coding sequences of about 18,000 genes, a uh, median of 150 fold coverage. Uh, with 76 base paired end reads on the Illumina high seat, uh, looking for somatic uh, substitutions and small insertions and deletions. And the cases were identified in, in collaboration with uh, Roman Thomas at the University of Cologne uh, and the European Clinical Lung Cancer uh, Genome Consortium that he's been leading, uh, and with Harvey Pass at NYU and a few other colleagues. And we've done whole genome sequencing of 30 tumor normal pairs to 60x coverage in the, of the tumor, 101 base paired end. Um, uh, uh, Illumina uh, sequencing, and here we're looking for somatic rearrangements, copy number alterations, and non coding mutations, uh, in addition to the mutations covered by exome sequencing. One of the first points um, here is that um, you know, we see a lot of known uh, uh, mutated uh, oncogenes, uh, driver oncogenes, and yet if we look at simply mutational status, about half the cases lack a known driver oncogene in the 